All righty. Hello and good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah, we could hear you. Right, I hope everybody had a good break. And um, it's a bit of a mixed bag. We have uh, of our students in this course. We have, of course, lots of our master students. Uh, but we also have students that are PhD students, and we also have uh, undergraduate students in here. Um, so for those of you that are uh, new to me, I'm, I'm Kasper Larsen. I'm a professor in the math department. And, um, I've been teaching uh, mathematical finance and computational finance and quantitative finance for years, 20 years. Um, and this course here is a uh, it's a bit different than at least the 621 and uh, the 62 courses that the master program has to offer. If you're an undergraduate, you're taking 485. This is a bit different in the sense that there's a large um, uh, programming component to the course. And uh, what's interesting is that um, there are students that, that really like the math side of things and the define that this is what make sense to them. But in a course like this one, where you're suddenly being presented with all the numerics where you have to write software, then, then there's another group of students, of students that, uh, that find that much more intuitive and, and much easier to deal with. Um, so this course here is like, if, if you have a strong programming background, uh, but you are not so keen on math, maybe here you're going to get more intuition for it. I have seen this many times over the years that when you start taking these abstract equations and writing code and implementing it, there is a group of students that find that now it becomes clear of why it is we're doing all these uh, abstract equations in the first place. So I'm hoping some of that is going to come through in this course. Um, okay, so let me try to, uh, the way that I teach is sort of here in the beginning, we have to do Zoom every time. And then towards the end of January, I think we're going to switch over to being in person on Wednesdays and then and then we're zooming on Fridays. Um, there are really benefits to this uh, to this zoom in particular for a class like this one. Uh, and that is that I can use um, I can easily switch over and we can look at code and I'm going to start doing that today so you can see how it works. Okay, if there are any questions or comments, um, you just interrupt me and. Uh, I'll try to help you guys. So let me switch over to the document camera. And bring up my notes. So what we're doing here, this is uh, 623. This is the computational finance course. So, so what are the, um, what, what, what is the, uh, what's the content here? Right. The, the new thing, the new big thing is to do implementations. Implementational models. And um, so that means you need to get your hands on a, on software. So you can use you can choose your software. You can use whatever uh, programming uh, software you wish. So, so in class, so in class, uh, I I'm going to use I use uh, Mathematica. Some of you have already seen me use Mathematica. And then I'm going to use uh, MATLAB. Uh, those are the two soft pieces of software that, that I'm going to be using. Um, this one here, this is typically, this is, uh, this is very easy to use. Um, Mathematica, this is, uh, this is, this is nice for like quick, uh, quick and, um, uh, let's call it dirty uh, calcs like back of the envelope calculations this is this is good here the problem is that it, 
mathematica this is this is this is slow uh, it's slow and um it's full of uh it's full of bugs i, I even found a new one this morning in, in mathematica i'm going to see if i can <clears throat> if i can show you this uh this uh there was a new bug i found in mathematica and and this is even mathematica i think we're running on version 10 or 11 right so you would have thought that you would have cleaned it up at this point but no it's, it's still full of bugs there really are a lot of bugs in there and <clears throat> it's even to the extent that you can run your software on one machine and then it runs fine and then you switch it over and run it on a different machine and then it won't run um, so mathematica it has a lot of problems in it matlab MATLAB, this is a lot more stable. Uh, there are bugs in MATLAB, but not very many. But one thing that MATLAB is really good with is um, it has a lot of toolboxes. So, so that's nice. Um, <clears throat> other languages, so um, other languages that, that you might consider using is uh, C++. This is, um, this used to be uh, mandated that all our students should use C++ for this course, uh, but this year uh, that that requirement has been uh, has been eliminated. Um, another one that uh, that uh, Professor Pham that you see that you have in uh, 622 for those of you that are taking 622, uh, Professor Pham he likes Python, so he are uh, he are uh, he are uh, both of these are uh, popular. Uh, the popular in, in the industry. Uh, it used to be, uh, it used to be that um, uh, Excel and uh, and the underlying VBA and they were uh, the go to in um, uh, in the industry. And Excel is of course still being used a lot, but um, the, the, the also available. Um, I think you want to have a hard time if you want to code uh, your homeworks in Excel. Um, I, I don't recommend using Excel and VBA in this course. I think the, the uh, I think you're going to have a hard time uh, doing this. Uh, I would recommend using C++, Python, MATLAB um, for your homeworks, and then use Mathematica or Mabel. If you have Mabel on your computer uh, to, to, to help you do some of these calculations that are uh, just to get started. I will not recommend using VBA and, and Excel. If you have a Mac, uh, a Mac computer, you have the numbers in there too uh, as, your, as your spreadsheet. Um, and I don't recommend using, using that either. This is, uh, this is fine to, to store some data in, but, but here you're going to be the programs you're going to be using, uh, I think you're going to have a hard time implementing those in, in standard spreadsheets. Okay, are there any comments on this? I should also say here that <clears throat> our TA, uh, Sherry, that most of you know, um, she, she has office hours and, and when you have problems with your code, uh, that's one of the things that that your TA uh, is there to help you uh, try to find uh, try to find um, uh, the box that you have in your code. But you, because there is a large implementation component of this course, uh, you're going to be spending quite some time trying to debug your code, find the errors. Why doesn't it run properly? And the TA is is there to help you with this. So then the um, so what, so what is the content, right? So, <clears throat> so we're going to use, we need, we need Brownian motion and more prominently, we need Ito's lemma uh, from 622, right? So if you've had, if you're taking uh, 45, you will already have seen Ito's lemma and Brownian motion. Uh, but what that means is here in the beginning, 622 has to kick into gear and it's going to take a little while for, uh, for 622 to get to, to the material that, that covers Brownian motion and Ito's lemma. All right, so here in the beginning, 
So in the beginning, um, in the beginning, uh, we'll do uh, we'll do other uh, uh, other uh, other things. Like so we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna lay the groundwork for uh, uh, for us to be able to to just jump in and use each of and Brown emotions and so on. When you guys have seen it in six two two. Right, so that that includes like some some basic uh, Monte Carlo simulation. So we're going to be doing that uh, basic Monte Carlo simulation, and then when we when we have when we've then seen Ito's lemma and Brownian motion and so on, then we can start doing more advanced uh, Monte Carlo simulation based upon these tools. We're going to do uh, characteristic functions. Um, you have seen those, if you're taking my uh, 621 class, we have talked about characteristic functions. And what we need here is this big theorem. This is called the inversion theorem. So that's, that's the one that we need from, uh, and this plays a major role in a class of uh, stochastic volatility models that, that we're gonna be studying. Uh, another thing we'll do here in the beginning is we'll look at copulas. Uh, the other things we look at is, um, so today, for example, we're gonna be taking a little detour and look at something called cubic splines. This is today. Uh, but there are other topics like um, principal component analysis. Some of you might've heard about PCA. So there, there are other things that we will do. And then finally we will get into, uh, then we'll get into the meat of it. And then what, what we'll do is, so, so so after we have gone through all of these, these things that don't rely on Ito's lemma and Brownian motion, then we'll get into the meat of it and we'll start doing stochastic wall models. We'll start doing uh, uh, PDE uh, techniques. Uh, so here we look at PE techniques. We look for the European pricing, and we'll also look at them for American. And then we'll look at simulation techniques. Uh, also for European options and American options. So this this here, this bottom part here, this is the real application, right? This is what makes it is what makes it computational finance. The first part up here, this is more of a background. Uh, and then when we get bound in motion each lemma uh, mastered, then we will jump right in and apply these tools and techniques to to look at um, to look at how one would go about say pricing a European option in a stochastic volatility model. How do you write code? How do you do these things? Are there any questions? In terms of um, in terms of grading. This is a bit, this is quite different than, than what you've seen in, in 621. So there used to be, this class, it used to have a large project at the end, but this has been changed uh, starting this year. We don't have a large project at the end. Um, I'm also not gonna have exams in here. We'll have, I, I, my guess is we will have about uh, six homeworks. To the large. My you have about six homeworks, and that's going to be your grades is going to be you're going to be sort of the equally weighted. And then your, your grade will be the usual. So you rate an A, 
uh, when you're between 90 and 100, you get B, uh, Bs, this will be uh, from 80 to 90. Uh, Cs, this will be from uh, 60 uh, to 80. And then, uh, yeah, if when you're less than uh, 60. <clears throat> so these are individual homework, right? The, the individual. The individual. So you can collaborate. You can talk to each other. But you can talk with each other and you can discuss results and so on. But but uh, but you must uh, you must write and submit uh, by yourself. And uh, and do not copy. Don't copy from others. That includes uh, past years uh, students homework. All right. So don't don't do this. This class here. It's going to be less intense in the sense that you won't have these all exams and you won't have these written exams. Um, instead, I'm hoping that we can try to master this material. And I say this to all, every time I teach a course, I say the same thing. Take, please try to use, try to use our office hours. All right, so we have Sherry. This is TA, uh, TA, right? She has office hours on Wednesday and Thursday nights. And then me, I have it on uh, Friday mornings. And then of course we have class where you can also ask questions. This material here is no different than 621. Uh, it can easily run away from you if you're not on top of it. And trying to catch up, this is it's possible, but it's it's tend to be very difficult. It, it's much better to get started building up this routine of coming to office hours to discuss uh, homeworks and issues that have come up in the lectures, stuff that you don't understand, can't follow. Is there a typo there? Is there a mistake and stuff like that? And a lot of you do that, and and that works really well. But try not to let this material run away from you. It, it'll be a great shame. Um, It'll be a great shame to, to lose out on, on understanding all this material here. Um, as I said, it is really the case that this material here, it, it combines very theoretical concepts and then it implements it. So maybe try to drive, drive that point home. Let's, let's have a look at, let's have a look at the um, our first homework. So let me see if I can remember how to do this. Yeah. Okay, so so let's try to pull up the first homework on the screen. Share screen. Okay, can you guys see my uh, my first homework here? Yeah, we could see it. Can you see it? Okay. Right. So this is <clears throat> that one is available on Canvas as usual. Right. So so you, you get this flavor, like what, what is it we have here, right? So there's an abstract, there's a theoretical question, there's another theoretical question, right? And then suddenly you're being asked to implement it. And then it goes back, like theoretical question, and then asked to implement it. So this is kind of the, the you'll see this in, in many of the homeworks that there are these abstract questions and then you're being asked to implement the solution of these abstract questions. Uh, so you can see here, there's something about generating normals and using QQ plots and so on. So we haven't talked about any of this stuff yet, but it's gonna come. Uh, what I'm gonna be talking about today is this uh, last problem here, problem number six. And um, 
for those of you uh, that remember your homeworks in 621, you recognize the first part of, um, of this problem here. Uh, it's about swaps and you're given swap rates and then you're being asked to invert it to get zero coupons. And then there's a question about cubic splines and plotting these uh, results that you can get out. <clears throat> so what I wanna start by doing today for a little while is to revisit these swaps because one thing I saw in the all exams we had in, um, in February, I, I did see there was a number of students that struggled with these swaps. And um, so I wanna go over that one more time. And, uh, uh, and this, is gonna be, uh, this is gonna be useful for, for you guys solving this, um, this problem here on the homework. So we're gonna start by today, we're gonna Today we're going to talk about cubic splines, but before we get there, uh, we're going to be doing, we're going to be uh, revisiting, we're going to be going over swaps uh, one more time. And for those of you that didn't take six to one, then, then you'll have a refresher now uh, on, on how to do, how to think about swaps. So swaps are quite, quite important because um, like in, in reality, <clears throat> you don't get to observe zero coupon bonds, right? These Bs here are the zero coupon bonds. Zero coupon bonds, they're not available per se uh, in the market. What is available is, um, is these swap rates down here. So we have 12 swap rates, right? So S1, S2, S3, and all the way up to S12. They are available, they are quoted. You can just, if you, you're sitting in front of a computer, you just open up, open up Google and go to US Treasury and you can see what the current US Treasury uh, swap rates are. Right, so these are default. We, this is what we will call default-free, um, default-free swap rates. And so, what what one can do then is to use these twelve numbers in this case, uh, and based upon those, you can recreate these zero coupon bonds. And now, having recreated these zero coupon bonds, you can now create uh, yield curves, which is quite important for fixed income, as 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 you all know. Okay, so let me let me start by talking about swaps, and then uh, then try to use uh, try to use these swap rates to recreate yields and zero coupon bonds, and then move into this uh, cubic spline interpolation method that, that is being asked for here. Okay, so so let's re so let's let's go over swaps again. Uh, as I said, there were there were issues with this uh, when we saw the the oral exam. There was a there was a handful of students that were they were struggling a bit, uh, trying to to clarify what what the various components in a swap contract is. But so there are two legs. There are two legs in a swap contract, and this is not just in the standard uh, risk free uh, fixed for uh, fixed for floating rate. There, Typically in all these contracts, there are two legs, right? So there's on one hand, there's a fixed leg and there's a floating leg. <clears throat> right, and then there's this one parameter, there's the, so, so you're, you're, you're paying, say, you pay a fixed rate, You pay a fixed rate, say um, a K, and uh, so you pay a fixed rate K, and then you receive you receive floating. You receive floating, so uh, you receive floating rates, or you receive the fixed rate, and then you pay the floating rates. And this K here, this K here, this is set. K is set such that such that the value the value of the fixed leg right so those are the fixed these are the uh, these are the K payments and the floating rates that we're talking about here this is the R n minus one so that the value of these these K payments at uh, at times 
uh, n equal to one, two, and so on, up to the end. So a k payment at these uh, at these times. That's the value of the fixed leg, right? So we're going to equate that with the value of the floating leg. What does the floating leg do? Well, it pays it pays r zero at time one. It pays r one at time two. It pays r n minus one at time n. So the floating leg has these payments that are coming in through uh, the interest rate. And the fixed leg, that's the quantity, that's the K. And this is this K that you can observe in practice. It's when you go to uh, the US Treasury, uh, if you go to a US Treasury website to look for these uh, rates, these are these Ks that you will, that you will observe. So <clears throat> the name of the game is to figure out what should K satisfied. Right? So, so we're going to derive an equation now. Right, so the, the, the first goal is to derive derive k. This is this fixed rate. Okay, so <clears throat> derive k such that this equality is true. How are we going to do it? Well, we're going to look at the there are two legs and the easier one is the fixed one. So let's start with the fixed one. So what are, what are the payments looking like? So the way that we imagine these payments is as a timeline. So we have time out here. This is what we call N. So we're sitting here time zero. Then the first time is time one, then time two, and then all the way up to time capital N. <clears throat> and the fixed leg, as payments that are given by K. Right, and we're interested in what is the value of these future payments at time zero. So we're gonna move all these future payments back to time zero. And um, so because K is a constant, the way that, so, so to get the value the value of k dollars at time n, uh, the value of k dollars at time n, right, it's different. The value of getting, so I should say today's value, today's value of getting of k dollars at time n is what, right? So we have an n sitting here, here are your K dollars. How do I move this payment back to time zero? Well, I get K dollars in the future or you get whatever number of dollars over here times zero. Well, this is where the zero coupon bond comes in. And so you take your zero coupon bond, B zero N and you multiply it onto K. So today's value, this is time zero. So time zero value of getting K dollars at time little n, this is you're gonna take the zero coupon bond, multiply it onto K. So this means that the today's value of the fixed leg payment, you'll have to sum them all up. And we'll sum them all up from N equals, we're gonna get the first one at time one, we're gonna get the last one and type capital N, and then we'll sum them all up and multiply it onto K. Any questions on this? So this one here was the easier of the two and where I saw, where I saw students struggle was over here in, I, I saw the biggest struggle over here when it, it came to figuring out what about this floating rate. 
what about the floating rate? As we had the fixed leg is dealt with now, we have the value of the fixed leg. So this is the left-hand side of the equation. So this is gonna be equal to something. And now we have to figure out what is the value of the floating leg. So let's try to, <clears throat> let's try to do that. And this is more complicated. So the floating leg. So let's just recall the notation and the setup that we have. But we have, <clears throat> we have a money market. This is a bank. So they, the price of the bank units is denoted by S N zero. And how, how does the price process for the money market account how does that how does that involve over time? Well, it's going to start out. So the zero up there is inside parentheses, right? And the bottom one, this is an index n, and that n here is time, right? So at time zero, this here is my notation for definition. It starts out at one, right? And then there's a recursive formula for how to get it at time n, and the recursive formula is that you take the price that it has currently. And then you do this one plus R N here. Right. And this here's the interest rate. So you're given, you're given R zero, R one up to uh, say R N minus one. Then this is how the, uh, this is how the, um, uh, the money market uh, price process is defined. So you see the link here between, you see the link here between the, the interest rates, right? So they could be constant, they could be stochastic, they could all be the same. We're not making any assumptions on how these guys look like. Um, the way you get the next uh, value of the bank account is you iterate forward, right? So in particular, you would get, in particular, in particular, you would get that S1 that'll be equal to one times one plus R zero, right? So if this is, if this is a constant, right? This here is gonna be measurable with respect to, um, this one here is F zero measurable, right? So the money market account value at time one is measurable with respect to what you already know at time zero. And then you can iterate forward so you can get S two this is equal to one plus R zero. <clears throat> that was the previous one times the next one, one plus R one. But this is no longer F zero measurable. This is going to be F one measurable. And so on, right? So you're going to end up here with S N plus one. This is equal to one plus R zero, one plus R one times all the way up to one plus R N last one and this is if in measurable right we're always having the assumption that the interest rate is measurable with respect to the time point where you're at right we're not making any assumptions about what the interest rate process looked like right so in in six two uh, one we saw many many examples of um, of R uh, of R N. Maybe I could bring up some of them. So, for those of you that haven't seen uh, that haven't seen all these examples before, let me just bring up so you can see explicitly what I'm talking about. Hang on a second. Let me see if I can switch it over. <clears throat> so for those of you that took 621, uh, here there were, uh, I don't know, a large number of practice problems, 60 pages. And if you go through them, you will find specifications of the interest rate model. So here is, for example, one model. Like, so you could take the interest rate uh, process would be given in terms of these random variables epsilon n. Like, so here would be one specification of this stochastic process Rn that describes the 
the interest rate and which ultimately describes the um, uh, the money market account uh, price process. So here's one specification. You go a little bit further down. Right? Here there's another specification. Uh, and you, you keep going to this document for those who have it, right? This, these specifications here, the all over the place, here's yet another one, and so on and so forth. But right, so there are many ways to specify this <clears throat> when you're doing fixed income in continuous time, and we're going to be doing that as well. Uh, then there'll be other specifications that will involve Brownian motion right here. <clears throat> these epsilon n, see always uh, these uh, Bernoulli, see these coin flips, right? You can take two values, u and d. The same thing is true of in the previous ones. Like the epsilon n's, they can take two values, u and d. Uh, epsilon n here can take two values, u and d. And that's because we were working in this discrete uh, setting, uh, the binomial model. Here it's different. Uh, we're going to be working in. Um, we're going to be working in continuous time. We're going to have a Brownian motion towards the end of the semester describing the, the interest rate. So what I'm doing here <clears throat> is I'm, I'm not specifying at all. I'm not saying anything at all about what these are. They could be constants. They could also be stochastic. They could be one of those models that, um, that you've seen, those of you that have uh, seen uh, my course on 6 to 1. It could be one of those. If you're taking other courses in 45, you presumably have seen other stochastic interest rate models. It could be one of those. We're making no assumptions beyond, uh, beyond that you're given the sequence and they have these right measurability properties. Are there any questions so far? You guys are very quiet. You're welcome to ask as many questions as you want. Just shoot. So then the next thing you do is you need to have a theoretical idea, a theoretical formulation for what uh, what should the zero coupon bonds be? So we need to know, so the zero coupon bonds, and the zero coupon bonds, the, uh, so again, you have time here, and then there's some time point here. And this is where you get your, um, maybe it's called M this time. All right, so there's a time point here and you're gonna get your $1. That's what characterizes a zero coupon bond. So you're going to move this zero coupon bond back to wherever you are. If you're sitting here, time n, or you could also move it all the way back to time uh, the zero if you so desire. <clears throat> right, so the formula that, that that we have is that you compute the expectation under a risk-neutral measure, and then what you do is you take the money market account. You're sitting out here at. Um, you're sitting out here at time M. So I want to move it back. I think I should swap these. I'm, so. So I'm looking at the value, say at time zero. So the expiration date is M. Right? How would this be defined? Well, this will be the conditional expectation of one, and then you discount it. If we, um, right, so we could, for example, have we could, for example, have that M would be one. So we're looking at, we're looking at just over one time period. So here you have your one, here you have your zero, you get $1 tomorrow. Then you would have B zero one would be E tilde of one over, and then this would be S one, which we know what is. Right, that was exactly what we had on the previous slide. This is one plus R zero. So this is gonna be the expectation of one over one plus R zero. <clears throat> but this is already, this is a constant. So we will have one over one plus R zero here. That'll be our zero coupon bond that matures one day, uh, one time point from now. 
we could go further and we could say, well, what about what about if I take if I take m equal to two? <clears throat> well, then we're looking at b zero two here. And what would that be? We'll use the formula. This would be the expectation of one over, and then it will be s two zero. That one we also worked out, right? That was this guy here. So this will be one over one plus r zero times one plus r one. And it's true that this thing here is a constant, so he can go outside. But this one here is not a constant. Right, so this here is not the same. This is not the same as one over one plus r zero times one plus r one. This is not the same because uh, r one is only f one measurable. Right, so you cannot, you can't treat r one as a constant and simply just drop the expectation. But to figure out what this here is, this is where you need a specification of what R, uh, R1 is. What is the distribution of R1 under this risk neutral measure? Right, so, so keep this in mind. It's true that if R1 is a constant, then you're going to get it. But in general, R1 is not a constant. And so you can't just proceed like this. That was, that was, that was something that came up in the oral exams in, in December. So another thing that so to move a little bit forward, uh, <clears throat> another thing that, that does come up is, is we, instead of looking at prices here time zero, right? That's the first one. If we instead looked at it at time n, so what would be n m b? Well, we have to alter the formula a little bit. This is going to be an expectation, right? And then what happens is that you move your m dollars back to time zero, and then you push them forward to time n. So what happens here is that you have the formula, you're moving them back to time zero, and then forward to time n, and then you condition on fn. Right, so the, the calculation that we do need is, is uh, if I look at M here being uh, N plus one, this is the calculation that we're gonna need in the, <clears throat> for the floating leg. So let's just, let's have a look at that particular case. You will have B N N plus one. I should say here that maybe some of you are not used to this particular way of writing conditional expectation. Let me see if I can find a pencil. Kids ran away with all my pens. They're all gone. Okay, so next time I need to bring up some color pens. Right, so you sometimes see this thing here written as some professors, uh, some people write, not just professors, but students and researchers in general, derive this here as conditional expectation. And then this N out here, you put it down there. So it's E till the N and then the same stuff up here. I see you, if you're used to seeing that with me, you will often see me write it out like this because the N here is, it's okay. You can do either one, but I, I kind of like to write this F up there. So you'll see me do that. For those of you that are used to me, you will know that this is how I typically write it. But the textbook, some textbooks, you write it like that. It's perfectly fine too. Okay, so so this one here is a special case of what we have up there, and let's just try to write it out. Uh, what do we get in this special case? Well, we'll do e tilde, right, and then you have s n up here, and then downstairs we'll use the. Um, but this is going to be n plus one. And then downstairs, we'll use the formula. We'll use the formula that links the money market account prices at two different time points. Right, so you take the, the formula here and plug it into this formula here. So this will become e tilde is n zero divided by is n zero times one plus rn. 
given event. Right, and now we see a lot of things happen, right? The, the S's cancel out, and then one plus Rn, this is already measurable with respect to Fn. So out we get that this is one over one plus Rn. And this is because Rn is Fn measurement. Okay, so I think we have all the ingredients to deal with the floating leg. We have all the ingredients to deal with the floating leg. Right, so the floating leg, just going back all the way to the beginning, the floating leg has these payments here. Right, so we need to do the same thing as we did for the fixed leg. We're gonna look at all these payments and then we're gonna move them back to time zero and it's gonna give us the value of the floating leg. So let's try to do that. So the floating leg so we again have time up here. So here at the end, we're gonna get R in minus one. This here is at time n. So note that this the, the indices here. This was one place where mistakes were created in the final was that it's not R n we get here, it's R n minus one. And the same thing, right, at the first time point, the payment we want to get is R0. And then at the second time point, we're going to get R1. But now these payments, they are random. And so we know what the, when we're sitting here time zero, we're perfectly well aware of what R0 is. Right? So we know what the payment is going to be one step ahead. But at time zero, we don't know what the payment is going to be at time two. You have, for those of you that are buying a house at some point, you can get a variable mortgage loan. And this is exactly how it works there. You will know what the interest rate payment is over the next period, but you will not know what the interest rate is gonna be over the next two periods. You can only know what it is one period from now. Two periods from now, there's randomness involved and you don't know what it is. But this is what this is, the situation here is uh, similar here. Right, and so what we cannot do, so, so getting, getting R n minus one at, uh, at time n, so you get this, does not have value, doesn't have time zero, a value uh, equal to B zero n R n minus one. This is simply just not true. It doesn't have that because this thing here, this is not if zero measurable. And so that's the big difference between the two, the two legs. When we were pricing, when we were pricing <clears throat> the fixed leg, we would have these K come in at the various future time points, right? And that K is a constant. Okay, so then it's much simpler to price this fixed payment coming in. But here you have variable payments and so we cannot just simply multiply this. This doesn't work. Instead, it's more involved. And this is the tricky part of it. So let me try to work it out. <clears throat> so to get the value, we're going to work backwards. Right? This is how we do the minimum programming. You start all the way to the right, and then you move backwards. So at, at the end, at the end, we get, we get uh, Rn minus 1. Right, and this is if n minus one measurable. Right, so we get it at time n, so we can easily move it. So the value, the value at the earlier time point, this is simply just taking the zero coupon bond and multiply off. And we're gonna get this value at the end. And this is if n minus one measurable, so we can move it back to time n minus one, and it has that value, right? So we're gonna picture, right here, we're sitting here at time n, we're gonna get this random payment, r n minus one. I'm gonna move it back to time n minus one, and the value is gonna have here, is gonna be that one. This is gonna be b n minus one n times r n minus one. 
Okay, so here is where we come to use one of the formulas we just derived, right? We needed we needed this one here. We needed this formula. We're going to use this formula here that when I only have one difference between n and here it's going to be n and n plus one, it's an easy formula. It's just one over one plus the interest rate. I'm going to use that formula. I'm going to use now. We're going to use that b. What are we looking at? N minus one n this is expressible as one over one plus i n minus one right that's this formula here when there's only one difference between n and n plus one we're just going to use the interest rate like this <clears throat> so this will allow us to express this quantity here as what this will allow us to express this quantity here as well, I can I can use this equation to see that I have one plus r n minus one times b n minus one, and this is equal to one. So I'll get I'll get that this quantity here, this is equal to one minus b n minus one n. Right, so I managed to move the last payment one step earlier. Okay, so at that last step, we have the value coming in from the future, and then we also have a payment coming in. So we're going to have the, the net, the net value, the net value at uh, n equal to n minus one. So it's going to be this one, it's a minus sign, it is one minus b n minus one n and then we're going to get the payment plus what was the payment this is r n minus two right so this here's the value this is the value from uh, n and this one here is the uh, the payment at time n minus one right, so the net value at time n minus one is going to be the sum And now what we want to do is we want to roll it back. We want to roll these. So now we have, this is the value we have at n minus one. <clears throat> we want to move it back to, so here we have n minus one. There's this chunk here, one minus b, n minus one, n plus r, n minus two. But if we're going to roll this thing back to time n minus two. And then we're also going to get a payment. We're also going to get a payment at time uh, in minus two. Okay, so <clears throat> how will we do it? We'll, we'll use that one. Uh, we'll use that one plus i in minus two is is already measurable with respect to it. We are getting it over here at time in minus one, but it's already measurable at the earlier time. So one plus r in minus two is f in minus two measurable. All right. So the value value at um, n minus two, we simply multiply onto the zero coupon bond, b n minus two n minus one times one plus r n minus two. Right, and that's what we just did. This is completely similar. It's completely similar to, um, to what we had here. Right, because what was, what is this? Uh, what is this quantity here? This is one over one plus uh, R n minus two, because there's only one time step between the two uh, indices. So we use that formula we had from before and you see now you net out really nicely. Um, so that takes care of the two first terms. The other one, the other one, this is the zero coupon bond price at an earlier time. So what you're gonna have here is a minus a B and then it's going to be n minus two n. Right, so we're just looking at the price process at an earlier time. Right, so the net, the net value, right, we're moving this thing earlier and we're also going to get a, a payment. So do we cancel out or get one minus uh, b 
n minus two n, and then I'm going to get the interest rate payment plus uh, plus the interest rate payment. So just as as before, I'll have r, and then it'll be n minus three. And you see now it's exactly the same structure as what we had before, and you can keep iterating this, and and ultimately ultimately you will go all the way back to zero the value the value at time zero and what will it end up being it'll be something like one minus b zero n okay So now we have the two price, the two legs, and all that remains is to uh, solve for k. So just so we can then solve solve for k. Right, on one hand, we have k times the sum. This here was the fixed leg. And then on the other hand, we have the floating leg. This is the floating leg. And all you do is uh, you saw this is going to give us an expression for k. <clears throat> and one thing we had talked about, and we're going to be talking about that uh, in this class as well, is this idea of bootstrapping, right? So. If you have never heard about bootstrapping, don't worry, it's not, it's not that horrible. It's basically about solving a triangular system of linear equations. So this is the solving a uh, triangular uh, system of uh, linear equations. So what you see here is if you have n, n is equal to one, Then what you have here is uh, you have k1 times b0 1 is equal to 1 minus b0 1, right? And this is one equation in b0 1. Right? So you can solve for b0 1. So if you have n equal to 2, well, then you'll have k2 times b0 1 plus b0 2 that should be equal to 1 minus b0 2 <clears throat> but you already have b0 1 right so you take that solution you plug it in here and then you have just one equation in b0 2 so you insert b0 1 and solve for b0 2 so that's bootstrapping. It's just solving the triangular system. And that's all it is. Okay. And any questions on, on swaps? So this is quite an important class of, uh, of derivatives. It's, it's, what's, it's where fixed income starts and looking at these swap rates. Okay, if there are no questions about it, I'm going to switch over and I'm going to try to do uh, some numerics here so we can see how, we, how one would go about solving such a system here. Uh, I'm going to switch over to Mathematica and see if I can get it to work. So let me see if I can get it to work. <clears throat> so can we all see my Mathematica code? Yes. Yeah. So the top part here is we have a uh, swap rates that are quoted. And I think we have 12 of them. So, so this is year one, year two, year three. And in practice, you also have you might not just have them at the um, 
it might be something that I quoted for like a year and a half, two years, two and a half years, five, five and a half years, and so on. But for this, for the homework, these are the numbers on the homework. So for that particular uh, homework problem, I just have them for, I think, 12 years. <clears throat> so what I want to do, the, the first step to go about to go about life is to convert these swap rates into zero coupon bonds. Okay. And the way that we're going to do it is this bootstrapping method. So just a hint, it's always a good idea to quit kernel uh, before you start doing anything in, uh, in Mathematica, right? So <clears throat> what was the equation we were, we were looking at? We were, we were looking at, um, we were looking at K times, and then here you would have had uh, the sum of all the zero coupon bonds should be equal to one minus X. Right, so what I'm doing here is I, I know we're going to have this bootstrapping method. So X is just the last zero coupon bond and then sum of zero coupon bonds are just the previous ones. And so what I'm interested in is I want to solve this equation here. K is the thing, this is a swap rate. And so I want to solve this equation here for X. It's of course simple and linear and you get this expression here. This is what the last zero coupon bond is gonna, uh, this, this is what it's gonna be like. And that's my formula up here. So I'll go about solving first, I solve for the first one. Then there are no previous uh, zero coupon bonds to keep track of. So I just create a dummy variable and put that sum to be zero. And then the next zero coupon bond, I'm just gonna solve. Uh, in that case, the sum here is zero and I'll just solve uh, as we had on the previous paper, paper. And just keep in mind, we should always update the sum here because when I come in for the second one, that sum of zero coupon bonds is going to contain the first one. As you can see, not very complicated code. There are many other ways to do this. You don't have to write code like this. It's just a question of solving a triangular system of equations, right? And then you solve it. And now it doesn't want to do it. Uh, so still does not want to do it. You can see I wrote S here, and I'm going to get back to this S here towards the end. So now it wants to do it. <clears throat> what we have here is um, uh, the zero coupon bond. So I take the swap, the swap uh, rates, like, and the first line that's mathematically spits out, and those are the corresponding zero coupon bonds. So that's how you strip uh, zero coupon bond prices from uh, quoted uh, asset swaps to so all fixed income desks will do this. Convert swap rates into zero coupon bonds, right? And then the next thing you want to do is you also want to convert it into um, into yields. So let's just uh, re recall what a, what the yield is. <clears throat> Just recall what the yield is. Uh, yields, so actually can be discrete. So these are like annual, uh, annually compounded. Actually, this is not the same as continuously compounded. Let's do annual yields. So we have a zero coupon bond. Those are the numbers we have access to now because we converted uh, swap rates into these um, zero coupon bond numbers. And what is the yield? Well, it'll be, uh, we treat the interest rate as a constant. So you have one plus Y here, and then you'll multiply uh, one plus Y in times. And now the thing that's left is to solve for this uh, YN here. So YN is a constant. When you solve for this equation, this is not difficult. This is one plus y n to the power n is equal to one over b zero n. And then what we do is that y n is then equal to what will be b zero n to the power minus one over n minus one. Those are the yields. And this will give you the yield curve. So let's see how that works in Mathematica. 
So I'm now converting, I'm now converting, um, I'm now converting the zero coupon bonds into yields by using this, this formula. And Mathematica does that. And here we get the yields. And of course we can we can plot these. We can ask um, we can ask Mathematica to plot them. There are lots of different plot commands, but if we do like a list line plot, it will plot the um, it'll plot the zero coupon bonds. We can also plot the um, the yields. And here's how the this is the yield curve. So all fixed income disks are going to have a yield curve lying around. <clears throat> so the problem is, one thing I want to talk about is that even though it looks like we have a straight line here, what we really have is just a bunch of dots. Because we are, we're looking at the swap rates that have various maturities. But we're not looking at like what happens in between. Like I have information about something that happens time one and a time two and a time three. How should you, how should we go about, how should we go about uh, values that are not at one of these points here? And so if you, so one option of course is just to say, well, I'll just put in straight lines. And you can do that, right? This is what math, Mathematica does here. Um, it seems to be, uh, in practice, this is not what people do. Uh, in practice, what people do is, in practice, what people do is these cubic splines that we have up here. So I want to talk a little bit about cubic spline interpolation. Are there any questions before I start talking about cubic spline? All right, so we took, took swap rates, converted them into zero coupon bonds, we converted the zero coupon bonds into yields, and um, now what we want to do is we want to do interpolation of these yields and how to go about doing that. Any questions before I start doing that? Um, I think I have a question. Yeah. Um, if you use a cubic spline um, to estimate um, the yield, like is there is does that include like no arbitrage pricing or is there so that, arbitrage? This is an excellent question, right? This is, this is an excellent question. And, and, and the answer is that it depends. This is, uh, this is more tricky uh, than, than um, right? Because you could, you, you could fear that the way you do the interpolation here would violate the no arbitrage condition. And so there is a large literature around this. Uh, how, what kind of interpolation are allowed to be consistent with no arbitrage and not all. Uh, there is a um, there's a quite famous uh, there's a quite famous interpolation method. Maybe I should. I mean, almost all the time. Okay, so maybe I, should, I should, let me just. This was an excellent question, Stephen. So let me let me bring up let me bring up. I hadn't really thought we would talk about that, but let me switch over to to MATLAB because this is where. <clears throat> where I have the code written. Um, so hang on a second, let me get you guys up there. <clears throat> Can you see my MATLAB screen now? Yeah, yeah, we could see it. We can see it, right? So there's something up here in lecture one, it's called Nelson Siegel. And um, <clears throat> this is, this is a quite famous way of uh, linking these yields to each other. And you can see my X's are the time points, right? So I have my 12 time points as before, and here are the yields. Those numbers here are exactly the ones we just computed. I just copy pasted them into, into MATLAB. And, uh, and so here is a way to glue these points together, which does not use these splines um, that I was hoping to talk about. But, Let's talk about this one here instead. This one here does, does something else and it looks more funky. Um, let me show you uh, a formula for how the, uh, the Nielsen Siegel uh, parameterization uh, aims to, to do business. 
Let's find the formula. <clears throat> okay, so let me, so let me see if I can get this thing. So, so this here is a textbook. Uh, I recommended this book in, uh, in 621 is Monk's Fixed Income Modeling, it's about 10 years old. So here's a way these yields, this is a Y. And you're trying to interpolate, uh, you're trying to, to get these yield curves that uh, uh, that we've been that, that we were looking at, right? We had we had a picture of, of one that we stripped from the um, that we stripped from the um, uh, the swap rates, right? So here are some different forms of this Nielsen Nielsen Siegel uh, parameterization of the yield curve, right? And so here's the specific form of the yield curve, right? So there are four parameters in this particular way of doing it: is A, B, C. And then theta. Um, how would this look like if I try to fit these four parameters to the yield curve that we just estimated? How would that look like? Okay, so that's that was what this little program is doing. Um, let me switch over to it again and let's try to run it. So what what the thing is here is doing, what my code is doing is it's taking it's taking these stripped values that we had. In um, uh, that we had from Mathematica, I transferred them over here, and now I have my four parameters here. They called beta one, two, and three instead of a, b, c, and then it's called tau instead of theta. But other than that, it's exactly the same. This is how it's uh, how it's done, and what it does is it searches for these four parameters to try to make a best fit of this um, of these uh, estimated uh, parameters. And let's try to run it. And uh, and let's see what what happens. This is Paul Nelson Siegel. Um, and I think you guys cannot see the plot, right? I have to share the plot. This is quite tedious to do this, but okay. So here's what Mathematica spits out. So it's again the, the the square boxes. The square boxes are are the data points. So this is exactly the same data points. These square boxes is exactly what we looked at over in Mathematica, right? And now instead of interpolating linearly, it's fitting this model from Nielsen Siegel. And here are the parameters that come out. And this is this solid red line. So this is another way to try to uh, interpolate um, these points. So I don't mean to say that. You can only use linear interpolation. You can also use these cubic. And now we're running out of time, so we will do that next time. We can use uh, even this Nielsen Siegel parameterization. And then Steve's comment was, "Is this is is it is it all kosher? Can I just do these things without worrying?" And the answer is no. Like this Nielsen Siegel parameterization that you're looking at here, uh, this is what has been done in practice for a long time. Uh, and here it's a four parameter family. Um, you can increase the number of parameters as well. Uh, there, are, there are extensions of this to include uh, more flexibility in terms of these parameters. I just looked at the simpler one. Um, and it turns out that this is really problematic when it comes to being consistent with no arbitrage. Uh, there are, there are this, this particular parameterization, even though it's widely used, this, this, this is problematic when it comes to no arbitrage. In general, this is not consistent with no arbitrage. Uh, so, so Steve, your question is spot on. Um, there are, it, it does matter how you do this, uh, how you link these, uh, in this case, the square blue boxes to each other. Uh, you cannot just draw uh, random lines in them. Now that shouldn't, that's, so don't be misled. That doesn't prevent people from doing that. And Nielsen Siegel is still uh, widely used. Um, we're going to do cubic splines next time, and this is also still widely used. Linear interpolation, this is, of course, the first thing that we would try to do. I wanted to show you how to do cubic. You can, of course, do quadratic and, and so on and so forth. Okay, are there any other questions?
Are there any other questions? Oh, I think this this might be a good time to uh, to call it quits. We only have a few minutes left, and there's there's no way for me to get through all the all the material. But we reviewed swaps here, and then uh, we looked a little bit at Nielsen Siegel. We're not going to talk more about Nielsen Siegel. If you're interested in it, you can you can easily find lots of references. Just Google them, and, and there are lots of papers on Nielsen Siegel. Next time we're going to do something about cubic spines. <clears throat> looking at how to fit these uh, cubic spline polynomials onto this yield curve. And then um, we're going to start on uh, simulation next time. Okay, are there any questions or comments before we, uh, we move on? So, so what's going to happen is that I'll put the videos up on, on YouTube and, um, and I'll scan my notes and, and put them up on Canvas. All right, if there are no more questions or comments. I'll see you all on uh, on Friday. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, just really quick, are my office hours on Wednesday and Thursday or are they on Thursday and Friday? Because um, um, I just went according to your last email and scheduled them for Thursday and Friday, but like I can change them to Wednesday and Thursday if that fits better too. Yeah, I, I, I don't know, Sherry, what was, I forget. Um, I think like in our previous exchange, you told me to schedule them for Thursday and Friday nights, 7.30 to 8.30 PM. And what was the original agreement? Oh, it's just, I think today in, in class, you said Wednesday and Thursday on like your first sheet of paper. Uh, okay, so let me, um, uh, okay, let me see if I can, uh, if I can pull this up. Uh, oh, okay, so it is, it's Wednesday and Thursday. It is, it's, it's, um, did I say something wrong? Oh no, it's it's okay. It's just I think I um uh in our this year's back in this is way back in early December, December first here. Okay. Okay, I'll do it. I'll change it to Wednesday and Thursday then. Ah, you schedule it on on so it's a good question. I I, I don't know. Do you do, do do you have a preference? I mean, I would prefer like the one that you, you've currently highlighted. I just scheduled it um, for Thursday and Friday, I think because uh, I got the dates mixed up maybe. Um, but Wednesday and Thursday, it works good. Okay, so I, I think because then, then there'll be office hours with you on Wednesday and Thursday, and then you'll have me on Friday morning. And then it's due Friday night. Okay, that's good. That's less stressful. Right? I'm just, I, I, I think having them Friday night, like this, it's due at midnight. So you'll have office hours, like two hours before it's due. I think this doesn't, this doesn't work for me. <laughs> it yeah. seems to be too okay. for me. Um, so yeah, I mean, if it still works for you at Wednesday and Thursday, I think we should do Wednesday and Thursday. Okay, I'll reschedule them then. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Already anything else?